Hey there guys, I'm Joe Garth, Cinematic Artist at Crytek. In this video tutorial, I'm going to be showing you how to import Quixel Megascans assets directly into CryEngine. I'm also going to be creating a terrain and putting together the scene that you see right now, as well as lighting and post-processing it. I'll also be going over some of the new features we have in CryEngine 5.4, such as terrain blending, terrain integration, and some new parameters in our material editor. So grab yourselves a cup of tea and let's get started. Quixel Megascans is an online asset library. It lets you pick and choose from a large collection of photogrammetry assets. All of the assets come with textures that are consistently calibrated with one another. The packages also include the option of real-time geometry and textures, ready for usage in modern game engines. In the first part of this tutorial, I'm going to teach you how to bring in a simple grass texture from the Megascans library as a terrain texture in CryEngine. Here we go. So the first thing you're going to want to do is navigate to the Megascans website at www.megascans.se. And here we can start looking for assets. I'm just typing grass into the search bar. And I'm just going to switch the type to surfaces. So these are all the various grass type surfaces. Uh, each one of these come with, come with a uh, displacement map. So you can see the sort of bumpiness on the side of the uh, sphere renders here. Yeah, this one looks quite interesting. So we have some options here. I'm going to choose the highest resolution, 4K, and I'm going to choose context real time. And then it's automatically sorting out which maps we need for real time. The workflow for CryEngine is a specular gloss workflow. So we're going to switch the workflow to specular and microsurface to gloss. Next, we need to make sure that we've got all the maps we need. Uh, we should have albedo, normal map, gloss map, specular map, and also displacement and AO maps. So everything should be ticked. It's important that we have a gloss map and specular for a correct PBR. Of course, when you hit download, you're buying the asset, uh, but you can download it again as many times as you like, actually. Once you've bought it, it's, it's free to download multiple times. So I'm just gonna hit download. Okay, great. So once you have the package, just extract that guy and we'll see what's inside. So you get this nice little preview here. Uh, it shows you the material you've downloaded. Uh, so for CryEngine, we don't really need that. We can just delete it for now. You also get a file with some information. We, can only, we don't need the JSON file. So the things we really need is just the maps. So what we're going to do is just going to go into our CryEngine directory. So here I have uh, my CryEngine build. Uh, and I'm going to go into my game SDK folder and into textures and terrain. And there you'll find a folder called detail. So this is where all of the detailed terrain textures are usually kept for CryEngine. And just to keep things tidy, I'm gonna make my own folder here and call it uh, Megascans maybe. Uh, just for the purpose of the tutorial, of course, you can create your own textures folder at some point. So inside of Megascans, I'm going to copy these inside. And the first thing I'm going to do is load this albedo texture with Photoshop. OK, so once Photoshop is loaded, you'll see this is your albedo. So first things first, we have to make sure that our Photoshop is set up correctly. So if you go to Edit, Color Settings, what you're going to do is just make sure that RGB is set to sRGB. And it should be this profile here, sRGB IEC 61966 2.1. Just make sure it's set to that, and then you'll be fine. Uh, and if you go down here and check gray, should be set to gray gamma 2.2, and spot should be set to dot gain 20%. Once you've set all of those up, uh, that's pretty much everything you need. Uh, the CMYK should be set to US web coated swap version 2. Basically, just copy my settings and you should be fine. And hit OK. So the next step is to go to Layers. And for our diffuse, we need to blend. You can kind of see how the diffuse is lacking any kind of shadow detail or anything like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to blend in the ambient occlusion map. Uh, so just open the ambient occlusion map with Photoshop. And I'm just going to copy that map across. So hit Edit Copy then just paste that guy straight into this document and you'll see it's up on this layer. And what you're gonna do is just change the blending mode here from normal to 
multiply. So what this is doing is just multiplying it, multiplying the ambient occlusion map in, and you can see how there's more detail coming in to the map. So for the albedo, we want to get rid of all of the color information from the map. This means that CryEngine can paint its own color down. So to achieve this, we're going to put a high pass filter over the top. So to apply a high pass filter, simply go up to filters, and then choose other, and then high pass. You can see that you can manipulate the radius, but we don't really need to do that for this. Just put it on maximum. and then hit OK. Now your terrain texture is high passed and ready to go into CryEngine. So to get the albedo map into CryEngine, go to File, Save As, choose the CryTiff plugin, and make sure you name your map Albedo. Because we use the name Albedo, it's automatically detected by the CryTiff exporter as an Albedo map. However, because this is a terrain texture, we want to choose Terrain Albedo High Passed and then hit OK. And so the next step is to export the normal map. So again, right click on the normal and choose the Photoshop. And there's our normal map. Once we've got the normal map inside of, Cry inside of Photoshop, we need to add a couple more things. So in channels, we need to go to channels and we need to add an alpha map. And what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna load the gloss map into the alpha channel of the normal map. So I've just loaded the gloss map here in Photoshop. I'm just going to go file copy, uh, sorry, edit copy, and then choose this alpha map. There's actually a little, uh, to make an alpha map, you just click this little button down here in Photoshop. You probably already know that. Uh, and then go edit paste. So now I've got as the alpha uh, right here in the normal map, uh, the gloss map. So normal map, gloss map, normal map, gloss map. It could be that we have to tweak the value a bit on the gloss map later it depends if it, it depends if it looks good in CryEngine or not. Uh, it's fairly easy to do that. You can just you know of course tweak the the brightness and the contrast and just kind of fiddle around with it until it looks good. But for now, we're just going to leave things at their default values and just see how it looks in the engine. Um, so yeah, once we're at that point, we can go File Save As. And I'm just going to go call it exactly the same thing as the albedo, but I'm going to call it, this time I'm going to call it DDNA. So grass cut, uncut, zero, one. So grass uncut, zero, one, DDNA. And then hit save. So you can see that it automatically chooses normals with smoothness. And that's great, but we actually want to change that to smoothness legacy. And the reason we're doing that is because CryEngine actually uses sRGB instead of linear space. And all of Megascan's library is saved in linear space. Choose legacy, um, make sure everything's set to 4K and then hit OK. So now we can see in that folder, we've got, so now we can see in that folder, we've got the TIFF file uh, that's being generated now, actually. It's generating, it's already generating DDS and Cry asset files for, uh, for me. Uh, so the CryEngine's already hard at work <laughs> compiling this stuff on the fly. Um, so next step, uh, the specular map. So I just load the specular map. And there's very little we need to do here. We just go file, save as, cry tiff, and just call it spec. So once, of course, once you get fast at doing this, it's very easy. Uh, it's really just a case of, you know, remembering these values and uh, yeah, basically copying them in the stuff into the correct places and then smashing out save as, save as, save as, cry tiff, okay, uh, whatever. You'll get pretty quick at it actually. Okay, and the last but not least is the displacement map. There's one small thing you have to do with the displacement map, which is that you need to copy the displacement map into the alpha of the displacement map. Just make an alpha and then copy paste that displacement map into alpha. Uh, if you don't do that, for some reason, the CryEngine won't detect it and it will not work. So if it's just in the RGB, it won't work. You need to have the displacement map in the alpha slot. So yeah, go up to uh, File, Save As, and Grass Uncut, and we're just gonna go underscore Displa, which is short for displacement, and then hit Save. 
and hopefully yeah so it's for some reason it comes up with albedo with generic alpha at first but you just have to switch that to displacement and then hit okay so now if we look in this folder uh, let's just move all the JPEGs into a folder called JPEG just to kind of clean things up a bit because I want those out of the way. So now we have a folder with all of the files necessary for CryEngine uh, to understand this texture. The CryAsset files have been generated already. Uh, you've got the DDS files have been generated and so on. So I'm just going to go straight into CryEngine and make a new map. And I'll call this um, landscape. And map resolution that doesn't really matter at this point. We can keep meters per unit to one so that it's quite high res. And just hit OK. So now we have our map loaded. Uh, I'm just going to go to some sort of sensible point in the map, maybe right in the middle. I'm just going to create an object just to kind of give me a sense of space <laughs> so I know where I am. And I use control shift just to move the object around somewhere. And then once I have that, I can kind of just zoom in right here. And there we go. That's kind of like the middle of the map. I can also go in properties and just set the position to exactly 500. So I actually know it's right bang slap in the middle. It's right in the center. So now I have this area, I'm just gonna go to the terrain editor. You can find that under the tools, terrain editor panel and go to paint. And you can see right now it's just got one paint terrain um, texture and that's just called default. And that's basically what you see right here with this uh, grid, grid lines. So I'm gonna go and create layer and I'll make a new layer here and I'll call it uh, grass uncut one, which is obviously the same name as the grass texture that I've just imported. Uh, I'm gonna set the texture here from white to uh, one of the textures that I can find right here in the texture folder. So if I go into game SDK textures, terrain, you can see that there's already some nice textures that we can use right here. Um, so really these are actually just the maps for the overall, uh, so these are the textures for the overall terrain. These aren't like detailed textures or something. This is really just to kind of get the basic color of what you're painting down. So really, I want my grass to be something more like, I mean, there's the typical green grass, but if you would choose something like this, you could have a bit more of a nice um, desaturated green. So you can see that's kind of painting this kind of brownish color, which look, might look quite interesting for grass. Um, we'll have to see. And so the next thing you want to do is select a material. Now we haven't made a detailed ter terrain texture material for a new texture yet. So we need to go into material editor and we're just going to go into the materials folder here. Sometimes you have to go here all materials because if you go used in level you won't be able to see anything because we're not using anything in this level right now. So just make sure that used in level is set to all materials and then you'll be able to see all of the stuff in the build. Uh, and then you go to materials terrain and you can see in here there are already some interesting materials that uh, are already set. I'm just going to dock the terrain editor there on the side so we can actually see as we kind of go through this list uh, what those what those actually look like. Um, so if we open up this guy, we can now go into uh, materials, terrain, and you actually can get a sort of preview of what those look like. As you kind of click through and of course some of them don't look so great right now they're just kind of but yeah you get the idea they're different detailed textures for the terrain 
So I'm going to kind of choose one that's similar to what I want. Grass 2, I guess. Uh, and I'm going to get that, and I'm going to... Um, duplicate or copy paste and now I'm going to go into game SDK materials terrain and I'm going to call it grass uncut oops uncut zero one go save and now you can see I got this grass uncut zero one I'm going to just go back to this uh, terrain editor now and choose grass uncut zero one you can see it's right there it's kind of covered up by something but uh, now we can see that that's the same material but we've also we've got generic uh, cry engine textures applied right now so we're going to switch those to uh, custom mega scans textures so I'm just going to find that folder that we have detail so came SDK textures de terrain detail mega scans and point to my grass folder and then start choosing the mega scans grass. Okay. So now we can kind of play around with the settings here and choose the settings that we think look best for this. Um, so you can see there's like a detail texture setting well, this is basically how much texture strength the albedo map has uh, we also have to make sure that we set all of the stuff up for PBR so if you set specular color to basically what grass is which is is in this case something like 30 or 40 it's it's quite low it's not gonna be super shiny it's, it's only grass um, Make sure smoothness is set full because you want it to utilize the full range of smoothness. And then we can also play around a bit with our displacement map and just see what that's doing. So it gives a bit of bump, a bit of sh self shadowing, uh, which is quite interesting. That's a simple terrain texture. I'm just gonna maybe adjust the lighting a bit in our scene just to give a bit more of an exaggerated look you can even see the it's really cool because you can even see the kind of the shadows uh, from the displacement map already and I didn't really have to do anything you know and it's already looking kind of interesting and quite quite real maybe even I'll just go in closer with my FOV and just kind of show how that looks I think it looks really quite nice let's maybe just try and get a bit of a render out right now uh, if you go to, if you ever want to have some of the cool stuff, like there's a couple ways you can do it. If you ever want to have some depth of field, you can just go in environment editor and just pump that up. So blur amount, just go crazy with it, and then uh, turn down the focal range. And you can see how there's already depth of field uh, just coming in. Didn't really have to do anything. It's just one value right here, and you can set that to whatever you like. Uh, if you actually want to have more control over that. Uh, you can, of course, go into the track view right here, which is more like the cinematic tool. Uh, I usually just dock that on the side there. Um, I'm just going to set the... <laughs> you can see I already have this uh, 21 by 9 uh, aspect ratio for renders. And this is actually quite nice because it, um, it... I don't know, it just gives a cool cinematic sort of look. Um, and... Uh, kind of feels uh, more interesting. So yeah, if we want to get something that's more like um, a beauty render, we can just make a little scene here. I'll just call this depth of field. And this is making me, an, uh, this just makes me a new track view sequence. And just hit this right here. Uh, this little plus will give you a list of the nodes you can add, but I'm just going to add this one depth of field and just add a new key here at the very start and call it that's called enable and if you just go anywhere there you can start adding these keys down for all the various tracks They've, you've got three options you've got focal distance focus distance focus range and blur amount and i'm just going to set that up as a bit of blur amount 
and the focal range I'm going to put to like three and the focal distance on like one and you can kind of see what the depth of field is already doing kind of as I'm kind of moving that value out so th there you go you can kind of see how people are getting these um, these quite pretty renders with mega scans without so much uh, effort you know it's it's really out of the box already quite beautiful and of course now I could go to this next level and start like you know doing more lighting work and really trying to make this look good it's all about having having fun with it just playing playing with with the settings and seeing what works and what doesn't seeing if you can seeing how far you can sort of push it in the lighting department you know how far you can go with it that's pretty much everything for importing a texture from Megascans as a terrain material in CryEngine. In this next part, we're going to be taking a Quixel Megascans mesh and bringing it into CryEngine with full PBR. So let's go through the Megascans library and just kind of find a rock that looks interesting. So if you want to see it for rocks, we'll just go up here and just type rocks and 3D. I'm just going to go down the list and see what I can find. Um, see what would maybe look interesting with my my grass. You can really spend a long time just searching for that perfect rock. Okay, so this rock right here looks pretty convincing. I think that's quite cool. Yeah, wow, look at that. Lots of detail. Uh, so essentially the the 3D process is pretty much, sim it's quite similar to importing a texture uh, with the added uh, extra of having the mesh as well. There are a few things you have to remember with the uh, checkboxes here. So my resolution, this time I'm going to use 8K resolution because I want to have really, really high quality maps. Uh, and I'm going to choose real time for the uh, model context. The workflow is again specular and gloss. And I'm going to choose mesh format FBX. And when it comes to LODs, I'm going to go 7,282 tries. So the maximum number of game ready polygons. So high poly, yes, I want the high poly included. And when it comes to maps, I'm just gonna to toggle them all off and then I'm just gonna go albedo. Yes, displacement, I want that. Gloss, I want that. Normal, I want that. And specular, I want that. Yeah, the only one I don't actually want is fuzz. And uh, yeah, and then once you have all that set up, just hit download. So the download's finished, so I'm just going to go up to my downloads folder and take a look at the zip file. So I just extract that. And inside you can find pretty much the same as before with the texture, albedo, displacement. And you can see that we've been given the high polygon, uh, so the high CG mesh, FBX basically. So this is the pre-rendered mesh, high poly pre-rendered mesh. And then we've got a couple of LODs here, the LOD0 and LOD1. Uh, I'm not going to bother with the LOD1 for this tutorial, and we're just going to use the LOD0 uh, game mesh. Uh, so, okay, let's get started. So once you have all these files, just copy and paste those into your game objects folder. I'm going to go into game natural rocks. And I'm going to make a new folder here called um, Rock Sandstone 2 and paste all of those files in there. Uh, and what I'm going to do is check out if you go into CryEngine and you go up to Tools, FBX Import, Mesh. So this is the import mesh window and just go file import. What I'm going to do is go to game SDK objects, natural rocks, rock sandstone two, and I'm going to choose uh, LOD zero. Just a quick note on LODs. Importing LODs is relatively easy. You just need to download all of the LODs from Megascans, put them into a single FBX file, and then import those into CryEngine. As you can see here, I've got a max scene with all of the LODs loaded in, and I'm saving an FBX file that contains all of those pieces of geometry. 
When I load that FBX into the engine, you can see all of the various LOD meshes. They're all laid out on the left hand side of the import mesh dialog. There you can choose the various LODs that each one should take. Megascans conveniently names all of the LODs for you, so you don't need to worry about that. Once you're done, just save the whole thing as a CGF, and the LODs should automatically work in CryEngine. So now I'm just going to go File, Save As. Save in the same folder, Rock Sandstone 2. Call it the same thing, Rock Sandstone. To, and it's going to save me a CGF file. So if we go to the folder now, we can see it saved me a CGF and the cryasset file. And again, I need to just now quickly go through the process of doing all of the texture export in Photoshop. So yeah, albedo, and we don't need to multiply with the AO with this one because there's no separate amb ambient occlusion map. So that's basically good to go. File, save as, uh, crytiff. I'm going to call it the correct thing, rock underscore sandstone 02, save as. Albedo, <laughs> don't even let it load the preview, I just hit, I just hit OK. Uh, next step, uh, we're going to go to the normal for lot zero, and that's the normal map for that. And we're going to open the gloss map again in Photoshop and just going up to edit. Uh, yeah, we just want to grab everything, click, hit copy, paste that into the alpha. So we've got gloss, normal map, gloss map, normal map, gloss map, just as before. File, save as, creative plugin. And I want to go rock sandstone 02 underscore DDNA, DDNA, hit save. Choose Legacy, hit OK, Specular Map, just hit File, Save As, Crytif, choose there, Spec, this texture is too dark, if it ever says this just uh, go no, you don't want to go back into Photoshop and fix the darkness. It's dark for a reason. It's supposed to be dark. Because <laughs> it's not supposed to be that reflective because it's a rock, basically. Uh, so hit OK and make sure it's reflectance. It should pick that up if you type spec. And last step is displacement map. Uh, yeah, crucial step. Make sure you copy the displacement map into the alpha slot. Has to be done or it won't work in CryEngine. Uh, and here, Type display, display, displace, and hit save. And we're going to go displacement and hit OK. So back to CryEngine then. We're going to drop this rock asset in as a, a geom entity, a static mesh entity, sorry. And we're going to go into natural rocks, sandstone two, and just drag and drop the rock geometry in. And you can sort of see how that looks. Oh, my depth of field is very crazy right now from my track view. So I'm just going to adjust the range of it a bit further out so we can actually see the scene. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we can kind of also, it's cool that it's, it's already, yeah, it's already basically good to go. Uh, we just need to apply the materials to it. So how do we apply these materials? We just go to the material, how do we create a new material? We just go to the material editor, go to objects, natural rocks, and we're going to go add new material and then choose rock sandstone 2 and we're going to call the material rock you guessed it rock sandstone 2 <laughs> and hit save so i name everything usually pretty consistently that way i can find it this is rock sandstone 2 and we're just going to apply the material so you'll see that it's turned into red replace me which is 
beautiful. I love the replace me texture. Um, and now we need to go through the task of going to diffuse and choosing our various textures. So I go to objects natural, rocks, sandstone 2. <coughs> and choose albedo yeah, and you can see it's already got the albedo map there um, and so if I choose bump map and now normal DDN and you can see that something looks a bit strange with the normal maps on this one so what I'm gonna do is flip the Y of the normal map and see if that corrects it I think it's just that the Y channel is flipped. Uh, you have to just you just have to double check that each time and make sure that you flip it the correct way. So there you can see that the normal maps are looking much better now. Uh, things actually look like they're flowing in the right direction, and uh, yeah, the assets starting to look to look pretty good. So yeah, once you're at this point, um, we can now start to think about integrating it with the rest of the scene. Uh, one of the cool features of 5.4 is that we can now use this soft depth test technology. And so you can see as I put that on, it's now creating a nice soft blend between the asset and the terrain. And we can actually control that here with the test range parameter. That's really nice. It just just helps to kind of blend everything together in a really interesting way. Um, so yeah, there we have it. That's uh, Megascan's rock in the CryEngine. In this next part, I'm going to be importing one of Megascan's 3D vegetation assets into CryEngine. So let's go up to the menu and let's choose 3D plants. So Megascans are slowly introducing these awesome looking 3D plants, which are basically taking their scanned atlases and uh, introducing full 3D plants that you can download. Uh, and they look absolutely incredible. So grass clumps, we're gonna change the resolution to 4K because we wanna have a lot of detail. And the level of detail I'm gonna choose is log two because I wanna be able to paint a lot of this grass and without it lagging at all. So I'm gonna choose format EXR, uh, from EXR to JPEG because I just want a JPEG. And I'm gonna hit download. So that's downloaded. So we're just gonna to go to that folder and we're gonna choose the 3D plant and hit extract. <clears throat> So yeah, pretty much the same as before. You get a nice little preview of the asset, uh, a few variations of the mesh, uh, which we can look into. Um, and in textures, you get the Atlas, which is pretty much the same as uh, any other Megscans mesh, like rock or something. Uh, you just get all of the material, uh, all of the textures that you need. So, Let's go and copy this whole folder into CryEngine. And we're going to go into Objects Natural Ground. And there's already a grass folder here, but I think what I'll do is just make my own and call it uh, grass underscore clumps. And then copy everything into that folder. Uh, we can delete the free view, the preview and the JSON file as usual, and we can kind of just bring all of these vari uh, variations of the mesh into the main folder here. And the textures folder, we can kind of just get rid of this Atlas folder. We don't need that. And so everything is now grass clumps. We've got the three model variations, and we've got all of the uh, textures that we need. We can get rid of any of the EXRs and the bump. We don't need that. We really just need the albedo, the displacement, the gloss, the normal. Uh, we need the opacity. We don't need the roughness map. We can get rid of that. Spec map we need. Translucency map we need. 
So for a vegetation piece, we need to have a couple more maps in addition to the ones that we use for the rock. And those are the translucency and the opacity maps. The opacity map is basically an addition to the albedo in the alpha channel, which basically tells the engine uh, what part of the object should be opaque and what should be completely transparent so that it can calculate alpha. So that's very necessary. The other map we have is the translucency map. This is a map for, cal for calculating subsurface scattering, which is that kind of cool effect that you get when um, sort of light hits, uh, hits a, a leaf and you can kind of see the shadow on the other side and you can kind of get this, it, it has this kind of feeling that the light is going through the leaf and that you've actually got some kind of a thin layer going on. So it's very useful to have a subsurface map because what it does is it makes the actual body of the twigs and that kind of stuff sort of more uh, opaque or appear to be more opaque and it makes the leaves themselves look more translucent. So in this case, it's more like the, the actual shafts of grass have a little brightness to them. You know, they're kind of this green brightness. And then if you look at the actual core, the twigs of the, the grass, they're actually darker. Um, so it's very important to have a translucency map. So I'm just going to go in and start exporting these maps. So I've opened up the albedo and I want to make an alpha channel for the albedo. And I'm going to put the opacity map inside of that alpha. And just copy that in. So albedo, opacity in the alpha. And then hit file, save as. And we're just going to go and save it as grass underscore clumps albedo and hit save. And instead of saving albedo with generic alpha, this time I'm going to save it as albedo with opacity. And that way it's going to take into account my opacity map. So hit OK. So next step, normals. So I've got my normal map in Photoshop and I'm going to open up my gloss map as well. I'm just going to copy the gloss map, copy, and I'm going to go create an alpha channel, and I'm going to paste that in there. So normals, gloss, normals, gloss, hit file, save, I'm going to go grass clumps ddna, so again ddna means with alpha, gloss in alpha and cry tiff, save, and normals with smoothness legacy. Hit OK. And the specular map. In the future, we're going to make this a lot easier, so you won't have to do this manually. I promise that. <laughs> I don't want to do this anymore. So, <laughs> um, yeah, and the specular map is actually just a, a solid color for this one. But that's fine. It can be a solid color. Um, hit cry tiff. And I'm going to go grass, grass clumps, and I'm going to turn that to spec, and hit enter, reflectance, OK. So what's left? Uh, we can now do the uh, displacement map. And again, copy the displacement map into the alpha of the displacement map, hit file, save as. And the same thing as before, display, and hit save, display, and then displacement, hit OK. All right. And last but not least is the translucency map. The translucency map is that awesome subsurface map I was talking about. And what we're going to do is just save this as I don't actually know what this is called. Let's just go like translucency and just see if it picks up anything. I think there probably is a technical name for it. Um, I don't think you need to use it though. Ah, it's already detected it and we can choose opacity right here. So we want that as an opacity map. And then it already automatically converts this to uh, grayscale. Hit OK. So, yeah, I'm going to grab my JPEGs and I'm going to just pop those into a folder. Um, 
there we go just to keep things neat and we're going to go into CryEngine go up to tools FBX import mesh and sort of well let's just try one at a time I'm going to go to um, objects natural ground grass clumps and variation one and we can now go file save as grass clumps and we'll call it grass clumps var one variation one and hit save and I'm just gonna do that for all of those and yeah now the fun begins let's place one of these as a uh, static mesh and see how it looks with our material on it. So we have to build a new material for the grass. So let's just try variation one. Stick that in there somewhere, just as a, just to begin with. Um, and I'm gonna go to material editor. I'm gonna go objects, natural, ground, yeah, just right click on ground, hit new material, add new material, go to grass clumps and type grass underscore clumps and hit save. And then, yeah, same thing again, apply grass clumps and you'll see it's got this awesome replace me texture. Uh, but what I'm gonna do is go to diffuse and now I'm just gonna to navigate to that folder there. Natural ground, grass clumps, textures, and I'm gonna choose albedo. So you can see straight away something's wrong because it's not detecting any opacity. So what I'm going to do to get the opacity to be correctly detected uh, by the engine is just turn opacity down to 99 there. And now you can see that it's getting the alpha map and actually creating this interesting um, grassy effect. The other option you've got is one, you can choose opacity 99 and see how that looks. The other option is to choose alpha transparency and just kind of dial that down. The interesting thing about alpha transparency is it actually maintains some of the um, lighting information, which is quite, it's quite nice actually. Uh, so yeah, we're not really done yet. We need to still add the bump map, um, which kind of adds a bit specular map and we're just gonna pump the specular color up full and the smoothness up full as well. And that way you get these kind of highlights going on the grass, which look quite nice. <clears throat> and just kind of see how it's, of course, you know, if something ever looks wrong, like right now it looks a bit like the spec color is a bit much for CryEngine, we can kind of just dial that down to something a bit more reasonable. Of course, the other thing is that this isn't using the vegetation shader. So what we'll do is just switch to vegetation. And uh, yeah, if you see from sort of back here, it's it's actually looking pretty decent. Uh, so one thing we're kind of missing is a translucency map. And the reason why we can't use that right now is because we don't have leaves tick. So if I tick leaves, see it makes everything really bright. Um, a lot of this stuff with vegetation is just playing around. There's no sort of magic uh, value. So you can see there I've got this transmittance multiplier. And that's kind of just making everything on the, on the light side this color, basically. So if I change this to like a bright red, you can kind of see how it's making everything red. Um, so the reason why it's doing that for the whole asset is because we don't have the opacity map in. So if I put in now a translucency map, you can see how it made all the core of all of the leaves a little bit less. I'll just kind of do that again, just to show you that on and off. You see how it makes all of the, the bases and leaves. It's just a subtle thing, but it, it looks really nice. Uh, if I completely disable the translucency, uh, that's how it looks. So what I'm gonna do is just dial down the uh, diffuse again. For some reason for this scene, the diffuse is way, way, way too bright. And I'm going to upgrade the, the transmittance multiplier, but I'm only going to put maybe 0.5, maybe even less, 0.4, something like that, uh, because it's a bit 
too much usually if you don't do that. And the idea is just to kind of get the grass to merge in with the terrain a bit. So that if I do slot these in, you know, it just kind of, it just it looks like an addition to, you know, it kind of goes over the terrain and it kind of adds a bit more detail to the terrain. So, yeah. So what if I want to paint these now? Uh, because they're in a position now where I think I can kind of just start painting down all the spits of grass and, and kind of making it look more like this dense grass going on around this rock. Uh, so the way I do that is if I just go to vegetation editor <coughs> and I'll just hit add group and I'll call that grass. You just double click it and then it opens up the rename menu. Uh, hit add object. I'm going to go objects natural, uh, ground, grass clumps, and I'm just going to add these three variations. And you can see now that I've got these three variations added to the menu there. So if I paint these down, you can see that it's starting to paint the uh, material there. So what I want to do is I want to add the, so it's starting to paint them without the material. So I don't want that. I like what it's doing, but I don't like that it's not textured. So I'll just go down here to material and I just want to choose material grass clumps. And now if I paint the grass down, you can see it's already making loads of grass for my scene. And if I kind of go crazy with the grass. So now it's just a case of, of course, adding more to the scene and really getting it looking good. So I think what I'll do is I'll change my field of view a bit higher. And another thing you can do is of course, run around and make sure your scale is all set correctly. So this is already a really small rock on the ground, so we can actually adjust the scale that this is a bit bigger maybe. And you know, maybe the grass is too small. Maybe we want to make that even bigger. So here you can kind of choose the size and you can also add some variations to the grass. Uh, so let's just delete all this grass that we made so far and add kind of some extra variation to rotation. We want to make sure that it always faces the terrain normals. So what I'm going to do is just go 90 there and we'll see what that looks like. So this is kind of like long grass now. It's quite interesting. Um, maybe even less size. Or you do something like this where you kind of uh, have some big grass around and then you do some little grass and then we do some like really small grass to fill it in something like that but yeah you can see how you can get interesting results really quickly with mega scans and yeah so that's three steps now we've got the terrain texture in we've got the rock in and we've got the vegetation in. So I hope that explains for you guys how you can sort of start importing Megascan's assets and get those into CryEngine without too many problems. In this next part, I'm gonna be teaching you how to sculpt a terrain and texture it all in CryEngine. So yeah, this is where I sort of left off last time. Uh, you can see that I've still got my rock here. I've got my grass and my uh, imported Megascans terrain texture. But what if we want to make something that's a little bit bigger, uh, like a full scene uh, with terrain and everything? So yeah, I'm just going to see how far I get with doing that right now. Uh, we're just going to start building out a terrain in CryEngine. So if we go F of V60 and go a bit wider, and then uh, I'm going to disable this uh, depth of field that I've got on right now and okay you can see right now all I've got is just the rock and this little piece of grass here painted um, so instead of really deleting this I think what I'll do is I'll just kind of uh, yeah, I'll just kind of leave it because it's okay it's not hurting anyone and it's just one entity so I'll just kind of move out like that and you can kind of see where the rock is in the center of the map. Uh, I'm going to go to the terrain editor 
and I'm going to click on Sculpt. So CryEngine has its own sort of inbuilt terrain generation tool. It's not sort of, it's not super complicated, something like World Machine or uh, Geo Control, um, World Creator, that kind of stuff. It's more like a simple game uh, ready approach. And what it'll do is allow you to actually sculpt directly in the editor without any kind of, uh, you know, pre-baked maps or anything like that. You'll start out with something like this completely flat plane here, and that's not really so interesting. So just for the purpose of this tutorial, I want to get somewhere quite fast. Um, you know, one way of doing it would be, of course, that I start basically painting like this, some sort of mountains there, but that might take a while. Uh, and would be here all day. So what I'm going to do is hit this uh, function generate terrain and you can see it kind of generates these crazy huge spikes here everywhere. So one thing I just noticed is my terrain is actually quite small so if you want to make your terrain bigger just go here resize terrain and you can set that to 4k so what that's doing is setting up to 4 kilometers by 4 kilometers squared. So hit OK and you'll be able to see how it makes my map size bigger. So yeah, now my map size is absolutely huge. And my center of the level is now completely moved, but that's fine. And I'm gonna go again, generate terrain, and hit OK. And yeah, you'll get this kind of random noise, which doesn't look so impressive. Uh, but what we're gonna be able to do is use that random noise to kind of sculpt around. Right now the mountains that are generated are way, way, way too high. So what I'm gonna do is go up to here, edit, and go reduce range uh, heavy. And I'll just keep clicking reduce range heavy a few times. And what this is doing is basically reducing the range of the altitude of this map. So I just keep going, reduce range, until it starts to look more reasonable, like it's something that you could use. I think I will make something like a little inset in the middle here. So what I can do is just choose the flatten brush and then use control. You can see how I kind of, as I, you see the height parameter there, as I hit control on the terrain, it's taking whatever height my brush is currently on. So I'm going to just go up to height. Uh, I'm going to type 80, that's in the back ballpark of what I want. Outside radius, I can turn up to like 500 and this. And what I'm going to make is a little flat area in the center of the map. So like this, I'm just going to go go across and make this kind of flat, flat plane. It's a bit like Blood Gulch. Uh, let's undo that. I want to make it a more interesting shape. So we'll make it like 350 and I'll kind of paint some kind of a like this, that's okay. And you can see how there's some weird noise going on on these edges. So my hardness is set to one. Just make sure it's set a bit lower, maybe. You don't want it so hard that it's causing some kind of problems. And now we should have a pretty smooth plane. Just want an area that I can kind of look around that has some kind of interesting shapes, some peaks, some valleys that I can kind of put my character into the center of. And yeah, that looks quite interesting actually. I think I'll maybe flatten down some of the mountains around me because huge mountains aren't, <laughs> aren't always that realistic. Uh, in real life, mountains are Especially when they're in the distance, they're actually not as huge as you'd think. Um, so let's kind of look at that for, uh, yeah, that looks okay. So now we have this sort of generally sculpted terrain. Um, how do we make this actually more interesting? How do we actually add stuff like cliffs and rocks and kind of texture this thing? Uh, one of the ways we can do this is if we go into paint and you can see that I've got my, my actual grass texture here 
which is my sort of uncut grass texture that I was using in the scene before. Uh, I can already start to lay that down. Uh, but really what I do need is something for the distance. Because the problem with this texture is if I would like put this texture on this mountain all the way in the background there, it's kind of got something, but it's a bit blurry and it's not really doing anything uh, for that mountain. It's not really helping the mountain look better or something. So what I'm going to do is create a new material here, new terrain uh, texture. And I'm going to call this grass underscore distance. And what I'll do is scroll down here to texture and go to SDK, textures, terrain, cliff shrubbery, which is the same uh, texture that I used before for the up close grass. So it's using the same color map basically. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is create a new material in the materials, uh, the material editor. So right click to uh, just go to materials terrain, right click, go add new material. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go grass underscore distance and hit save. And from there I can then choose, uh, let's go back to terrain editor. I'm just going to kind of move my windows around a bit here because it's getting a bit too confusing. Uh, yeah, go to grass distance and we're going to choose here materials, terrain, grass distance. And now we have a custom material for a grass texture. So if we kind of go over there and have a look at what it does, we'll see that we'll see that this is basically nothing right now because there's nothing on there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab one of the uh, grass textures. Uh, that already exist. So one of the detail textures that already exist here, and you've got lots of them. You've got like mud, leaves, grass, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I'm just going to choose one that's kind of interesting. Uh, beach. Go to distance and just copy and paste that in. So if you see that, what I just did is like find this beach sand and I just go copy all and that copies all the values and then paste that in. So now you can see that that is using that detail material. That's not really the kind of material that we want to have for a distant mountain. So what I'm going to do, let's run back to this area over here where things look should look good from. I'm just going to save this location here. I'm going to choose grass two. Let's just have a look through all these various mountain textures that we have. There's this mossy one that's quite nice. Let's copy that one and see how that looks. So another thing you'll notice is that you can't actually see that detail texture from all the way over here. So what you can do to rectify that is go to level settings, terrain, detail, layers, view distance ratio, and just go 15 or so. And what that'll do is allow you to basically see that detail textures, uh, those detail textures all the way into the distance. So you can see all the way over here, you can see these grid patterns actually aliasing there. Now the benefit of that is that you can then go to the tiling of this detail texture and you can, you can turn that down. So it was set to 0.4, but now I can tile it to 0.1 and that's in that grass detail texture and you see that I'm starting to see some kind of a detail uh, some kind of detail all the way off in the distance there on this texture so if I kind of cover this mountain and that stuff let's kind of zoom in a bit so we can see this a bit better but yeah you'll be able to see what that looks like so it's kind of interesting. It's not really the perfect material, but uh, we can keep playing around with it. You've got this setting here for normal bump, which is quite useful. You can kind of increase and decrease how much bumpiness is going on there. Uh, there's also, of course, the amount of detail, texture strength. So a few different options. 
that you can use. The other cool thing about these kind of maps is that they usually have something like a displacement map. Um, so what you have to do is really just find a look that's cool and you use these tiling options and the bumpiness options and so on just to get somewhere with these various uh, textures. So yeah, once you have something like that, that's some sort of a grass material, you can basically start thinking about what other materials should be on this. For instance, rocks or uh, other pieces of variation, variations on rocks, that kind of thing. Uh, I'm just going to go into the environment editor and I'm going to disable uh, the fog. Uh, and what I'm going to do now is make a new material, call it um, cliff rocks, something like that. Hit save. And, well, you can already look into all of the various uh, cliff textures that come with CryEngine. And the one that I'm going to use is this one called Cliff Island 3D. Uh, and what I'll do is basically just copy and paste the Cliff Island 3D texture and use that for my Cliff Rocks texture. All I do is go convert to multi-material, set number of materials to three. And the reason why you're setting it to three is this is actually a 3D terrain texture. So what that means is that all of the various sides of the terrain are going to be given different materials. So I'm just going to change the submaterials to Y and rename this one to Z, Z, and uh, this one to X. So X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, you have three uh, different settings here. I'm going to choose uh, to copy the same cliff texture into all three for now, uh, but we'll just see how that looks and then maybe later we'll change it. So go into Terrain Editor, hit Create Layer, and now we're just going to make a new layer called Cliff Rocks, hit Enter. And we're going to choose the material, uh, the texture that the terrain is going to use. And I think I'll use this one right here. It's a gray material. And choose the detail material. Terrain, cliff rocks. That's the detail material we want. And let's just see what happens when we start painting. So you can see that as we paint this down, it's kind of this ugly tiling thing, which is not so great. We'll fix that later. But also, the main problem is it's just kind of going all over this height map here. So really what we want to do is we want to set the angle uh, that this will paint on so that it only paints on the vertical sides of the terrain. So to do that, you can scroll down here to where it says min angle and max angle. And we're just going to set it so that the minimum angle it can paint on is 30 degrees. And that means you can see, as, as you see, as I'm painting this, it's only painting on the sides of the cliffs. So let's kind of fill this whole thing with grass again. So we can kind of repaint this with just the correct. So, of course, this is just one small area that we can kind of get right and then you now have some sort of terrain with the uh, with just the angle based stuff now of course the problem here is that this terrain isn't particularly stunning it's just kind of blobby and it doesn't look its best so what I'm gonna do is yeah, I'll just repaint this again to grass and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to sculpt and go on raise and lower and I'm going to click here, Enable Noise. And then what I'll do is just kind of play around a bit with these noise settings. You can adjust the scale and the frequency a bit. And what this is is just a nice way to bring extra detail into your terrain. So let's see if I can get something quite interesting. without it being too crazy. 
So you have to just play around with the scale a bit and the uh, the noise, and you can kind of see what it's doing though. So once you find, so what I'm doing is basically I'm just hitting it with, I'm just clicking it with uh, the noise turned on and seeing what are nice settings basically. And then I'm kind of reducing those settings and then I'm control undoing and uh, I'm basically edit undoing and just doing it again and again until I find something that looks interesting. Um, so that kind of looks nice and more detailed. And don't worry if it's a bit too detailed for now because we're going to fix that in a second. Um, so what we're going to do is get this a bit more edge detail. Um, and yeah, now we have something like this. What we can do is, of course, go in smooth out some of this stuff. So I'm going to just go with a smooth brush and just create these kind of nice smooth uh, sections. So whenever there's something that looks a bit too dark or a bit weirdly blobby or something like that, I just kind of go in and iron it out with the smooth brush. And hopefully that creates some sort of nice shapes. The other thing you can do is go in with this uh, with this noise brush and kind of create some interesting looking um, some interesting looking uh, extra details, for instance, that kind of thing. Now we can go into our paint mode and let's start just painting that down. What I don't particularly like about these rocks here is just that they are quite um, tiled. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the terrain editor and I'm just going to have a look through all the various um, rock textures that I have available and just see which ones look the best. So yeah, now I have something like a distant grass texture. Now I've got these kind of more interesting shapes going. Uh, I'm just going to fix something here on this mountain. Um, so of course it goes both ways. You can kind of dip in and dip out and you can kind of add more details here. So this is really just the fun part, you know, you really have full control over this directly in the editor. Um, so I can figure out, you know, where I want things to be. It's really like just painting, you know. Um, and, you know, if you ever get anything weird like that, just kind of go in there and smooth it out. Uh, you can turn up the hardness of the smooth and just kind of smooth that out, add some more detail. So I'm kind of going over the uh, the mountains at the background here, just kind of improve, increasing those a bit. Uh, and then here, I'm just kind of maybe I'll add some more little bits of cliff cliff work there. Now I've got to that point, I'm just going to flood the whole of my terrain with grass again. So I'll make everything grass, and then I'll just flood the whole thing with my cliff rocks. I think I'll make a tiny tweak to the angle here that it's a little less prevalent so that there's not so many rocks a little bit more grass okay now we have something like a blending terrain um, let's just see how the this terrain reacts to the light so we can kind of see that the terrain is a little bit too glossy in my opinion. It's It's got this kind of weird sheen to it. Um, so that's probably just this, the, uh, it's probably just the specular map is a bit too high. Um, so you can already see the grasses one is actually really low. It's luminance like two, but what we'll do is just decrease the luminance even more. And the same thing for these rocks on the uh, sides here. Let's just go in there and make that really low uh, because we just don't want to. We don't want the distant terrain to have any of this crazy specular going on. There will still be specular 
because as you can see it's kind of still got these kind of glowing rocks there. So yeah, I thought I would just speed up this part a little bit. So you can see my process, I'm just sort of going through and finding ways to make it look a bit more realistic, adding some new features and just playing around with the noise mostly. It's not really an exact science, it's just a lot of trial and error. Then I decided to put this uh, the Megascans rock into the center again and just maybe paint down some bits of grass. And the grass wasn't exactly matching the material of the terrain so I just kind of adjusted that a bit and uh, try to get the colors to match a bit better. So once I get to that point, I sort of jump into first person and just start checking that everything is uh, correctly scaled and everything's kind of proportioned nicely and that nothing looks kind of weird or totally off about the scene. In this next part, I'm gonna be showing you how I create a scene, work on the lighting and the post-processing. So the next step is really building out a fully fledged scene so here I'm scouting around, trying to find a nice location that I can dress up and place a camera and create some kind of an interesting composition. I found this quite nice ridge where I could really focus on some of the close-up assets and uh, I could kind of play around with the, the grass there. So I'm sort of flattening off this area here. What's great about this area is that there's a nice amount of foreground and background which means I can sort of split the screen diagonally. So right from this early stage, you've got to start thinking about the composition and how that's going to fit together in the final image. So I'm now just painting in the uh, grass, detailed grass, and switching up the tiling a bit. And just painting on my 3D grass with the vegetation tool. It's great once you get to the point where you have all the different ingredients. It's almost like a color palette that you can then use to start painting the scene. So right now I'm placing some 3D cliffs that I've imported and just cloning those and rotating them, translating them, scaling them. I also use the cliffs to sort of break up the silhouette there. I think it's really cool how versatile this asset is. It makes some really cool and quite interesting cliff shapes without very much effort. Here I'm shifting the lights around to see how the assets look from different angles. I try and do that quite early on because usually it gives me ideas about how I'm going to light the scene. Here I was just importing some of the Megascans clovers and making sure those look really good up close and playing a bit with their materials and trying to get them to kind of blend with the rest of the terrain. So using the vegetation tool to paint those down and find some interesting patterns. Some more terrain smoothing, just working a bit on the foreground terrain. I'm also trying to work all around the camera in 360 degrees. So not just in front of me in the composition I want to create, but the entire scene. This usually results in a scene that's a bit more realistic. It's also good to bear in mind that there may be objects behind the camera that will project shadows in front of the camera. That's usually bigger stuff like rocks or buildings or trees. Since my intent was to make this into a forest environment, I had to think about what the trees behind the camera would actually be placed on. I tried to add grass at various different sizes so it's it's not always looking too similar. When it comes to painting the grass I usually find that diversity makes it look way more realistic. So different variations. So right here I'm adding some 3D scatter rocks. Usually when you have cliffs you'd sometimes have some smaller rocks that sort of uh, make a slight gradient. Uh, so gradually going from bigger to smaller uh, the further down the cliff you get. So here I'm sort of playing with the different scale and size of these scattering rocks. It's sort of good to push it uh, quite far before taking it back. So usually I try and make the rocks bigger and then see if, uh, if that's too much and then you know, maybe I'll delete those and then scale them down. It's all about quickly trying different stuff and just seeing what works. So here I'm bringing in the hero rock that we imported earlier and placing that somewhere in the scene, just because I thought it was quite a nice mid-ground asset to use for the scene. Here I'm adding a tiny bit of background fog just because I wanted to try and separate the background from the foreground. Again, that's really important in this composition because we've got that diagonal line that separates the foreground and the background. I use the diagonal line quite a lot just because I think it's a nice way of bringing order to an image. 
I also usually tie that in with the rule of thirds. So I'll probably place a hero object somewhere in the maybe the first third or second third just to give a bit of focus to the image. And once more playing with the lighting, seeing how the shadows look. So at this point I want to start thinking about the trees and playing with the different patterns that I could paint down with the, veg with the vegetation tool. So this is really just a case of tweaking the density and the slope minimum and maximum parameters in the vegetation tool. The slope parameters are a great way to ensure that trees only grow on the flat surfaces rather than on the very high angled cliffs. So you'll start off with some quite random results and then here I'm going in and just deleting trees that I don't like, moving certain trees around uh, and trying to fit them into my composition. You can see there are trees there on the top of the hill that I didn't particularly like the look of. And any trees that are sort of ruining my composition or kind of getting in the way. So there's trees down the hill were so high that they were kind of getting in the way of the rock there in the background. In the end, I decided on very on relatively few trees in the foreground. But you can still tell we're in quite a forested area because of the trees in the background and also the big long shadows of the trees in front of the camera. Decided to do a bit of a uh, little rock placement in the very, very distance as well. Pretty much the same technique I was using before. Bigger rocks closer to the cliffs and then gradually getting smaller. And once you have all the elements in place, you can start going in and tweaking the individual colors of different elements. So right here, I'm tweaking the color of all the leaves. I was trying to make a more sort of consistent green color for, across the whole image uh, for the grass and the leaves. Here I'm sort of playing around with the volumetric cloud functions in the environment editor. And these are very powerful. You can just go into the environment editor and tweak numerous options uh, for the clouds. And they're actually 3D volumetric clouds. Uh, there's a console command that you have to enable for these to work, which is r underscore volumetric clouds equal to one. You can also find some settings for the volumetric clouds in the level settings panel. And this is mostly related to uh, different tiling and noise scale. There's a tutorial on our YouTube that focuses entirely on volumetric clouds. I'll put the link to that as well as a bunch of other useful resources in the description below. So at this point I had pretty much a 360 degree scene. So I pretty much used just the same techniques of painting down grass and different variations of grass and rocks and uh, trees uh, to pretty much dress up the entire scene uh, around the camera. So once you get to this stage, of course, uh, you could always just call it done. So now it's sort of up to you if you want to keep pushing the quality level even further. There's a saying that that sort of 20% of polish and sort of reaching that final quality is what takes 80% of the time. But really, you need to put that sort of 20% in if you want to hit commercial quality. I thought it might be quite interesting to show you guys the before and after of my final quality push. I've included some high resolution versions of these images in the description below. So I'll talk to you a bit about how I'm refining my environments and how I sort of reach my own final quality level. So here you can see me sort of filling in any flat spaces with grass and just making sure that there's absolutely nothing that looks like a flat texture. I also didn't like the look of some of these smaller bushes here. They just look very low poly so I either scale them down or delete them altogether. After playing with the lighting a bit, I realized the translucency on some of my vegetation assets wasn't quite consistent, so I decided to tweak the values a bit. A lot of the final level of polish is also down to sort of going in and tweaking really minor details about sort of rocks and trees, just different assets that are perhaps getting in the way of each other or could perhaps be spaced out a little bit better. It's really just about making sure there are no strange intersections that give it away as a video game. I really wanted this to also work as a panoramic 360 degree shot. So I made the extra effort to go in and sort of detail everything around the camera. That's why you can see me sort of putting all of this detail into the foreground, even though you don't see that in the shot that I'm currently working on. And here I'm just putting the last bit of final touches into the very, very far distant mountains, adding the same texture that we used before and just giving it a bit more height map bump detail. 
I'm always going back to my sort of primary camera location and just seeing how the terrain looks from there because there's really no point in dressing something up if you're just way too far away to actually see it. Here I'm detailing the background with even more trees, trying to create a really thick forested look. CryEngine can handle so many of these trees that I don't really have to worry about painting lots of them down. I imported some mega scanned logs and I'm just scattering those around the terrain uh, to try and give a bit more of a realistic look to the forest floor. Obviously trees will die and bits of branches will fall off of trees, so that's something that's an extra detail that usually helps quite a lot. Another great way to add realism is to put smaller pieces of vegetation like bushes on the base of trees. It's quite rare to see a tree just sticking out of the grass or foliage without having some kind of reaction from the environment around it. So either small bushes or perhaps an area of soil. I wanted to get some snow on the very tops of the mountains, so I brought in my snow decal. This is actually just a completely normal decal, just scaled up and with a white texture added to it. So with 5.4 there are a couple of new features. One of them is the decal angle based fading parameter. So you can see as I move the slider back and forth, it's sort of affecting how much snow gathers on the top of the mountains. So I use this on every single mountain top, just so they have a little bit of snow up there. I really like tweaking the angle and just playing around with it until you get a quite realistic look. The other new 5.4 feature I'd like to demonstrate is the terrain integration feature. By clicking the integrate objects tick box, and also setting the global illumination property to integrate with terrain, your object will then start integrating into the terrain and taking the terrain texture that's beneath it. This can be really useful for scenarios where you want to have very complicated geometric shapes that are still covered by the terrain, or perhaps you can't get enough detail out of the sculpted terrain itself. It also supports overhangs in the terrain, which is really nice. These are some shots from a snow scene that I created to showcase this feature. Again, I'll put the link in the description. So, going back to our shot, I think it's at the point where I've got enough detail that I can start going about lighting the scene. Here, I've removed pretty much all illumination from the scene, and the only thing that's lighting it is the CryEngine sun. So the first step to any lighting setup is to find a cool sun position. You can see me here playing around with the sun direction settings, trying to find an interesting way of lighting the scene. I really wanted to get some illumination on that central rock, so to kind of bring the focus on that central piece. So, this is the angle that I ended up with. So the next step is to add skylight to the scene. To do that, I add an environment probe. You can find that under the Create Objects Miscellaneous panel. Right now I'm just creating a global environment probe, so I'm just putting it right in the center of my scene. Now if you go to the properties of the environment probe and scroll down right to the very bottom, here you can generate the cube map. Switch your cube map resolution to 512. This should give your reflections a bit more detail. Now hit the cube maps button. Now CryEngine will generate a cube map. Once it's done, it will say it's successfully finished generating. Once complete, go up to active and tick it. Now you can see the box where the environment probe is affecting the scene. Because this is going to be a global environment probe, we want it to affect the entire scene. So I'm just going to type in the box size parameters to make it 10,000 meters by 10,000 meters. So now it affects the entire scene. I'm going to name this Global Environment Probe. You might have noticed that while it does provide a bit of a skylight, the actual lighting isn't very advanced. It's really just a single flat tone. To improve things, I'm going to enable Total Illumination. You can find it in the Level Settings panel. Once that's enabled, CryEngine's Advanced Total Illumination GI system takes control. Here you can see me playing around with some of the total illumination parameters. You can use these to tweak the general look of the GI. In many cases this probably won't be necessary, but you can play around with it if you want to achieve a certain look. Most of CryEngine's lighting is controlled via the environment editor. I'm just going to run through some of the features and parameters of this tool. The two main parameters are Sun Direction and North Pole Equator South Pole. Sun Direction is pretty self-explanatory, that will just move the sun around in the sky. Whereas the equator parameter is actually the angle of the sun. You can use that to make the sun lower in the sky, or higher. There are many parameters in the environment editor. In this tutorial, I'll just focus on the main features. Here, I'm tweaking the sun intensity. This is basically the power of the sun for the entire scene. It's best to keep the value of this at around 100,000 looks. 
A cool feature that we have in CryEngine is volumetric fog. However, you have to make sure you enable this feature with a console variable. If you type in the console E underscore volumetric fog equal to one, the volumetric fog system will turn on. Then it's simply a case of tweaking all of the volumetric fog parameters in the environment editor. Here you can see me tweaking global density. For this scene though, I left the global density quite low just to give a slight separation between the foreground and the background. There are also a ton of settings for the sky and different skylight settings. The best way to learn what those do is just to sort of play around with them and see how they affect the sky. Here I'm tweaking the film curve settings for HDR. This is really similar to tweaking the curves of an image in, a, in Photoshop. Another way to make the image brighter or darker is to use the exposure values. By default, the brightness adapts from a minimum exposure value to the maximum exposure value. When lighting a scene, it's usually best to keep the exposure value constant. That way, the brightness won't change when you look towards the ground or up into the sky. There are also some filters you can put over the top, such as the photo filter. This is basically just making the whole image monochromatic and giving it a slight color tint. You can also tweak the depth of field directly in the time of day, and that affects the overall scene. I think it's quite nice just putting on a low depth of field and then going around and seeing what cool shots you can create. Another extremely powerful feature of CryEngine is the ability to use color charts. To do that, you simply need to take a screenshot of your current viewport and then take it into Photoshop. Here you can see me typing in console commands to increase the resolution to 5K before taking a screenshot. The console commands are r underscore custom res width, r underscore custom res height, r underscore get screenshot equal to two. That will set your viewport up for 5K and r underscore get screenshot two will take the screenshot. The screenshots will go into your user screenshots folder. You can then open those JPEGs directly in Photoshop. In the CryEngine documentation, you can find a complete guide to color grading. This includes the download to this small color chart that we'll be using in Photoshop. I'll include a download link to this chart in the description below. The idea is very simple. You paste the color chart over your image, then you add adjustment layers on top to make the necessary tweaks to color balance, contrast, and brightness level. Once you're happy with your color tweaks, save your document as a crytiff and add underscore CCH to the name. This means that CryEngine will detect it as a color chart. As the Crytiff plugin opens up, make sure it says color chart and hit OK. Now we're back in CryEngine, we need to apply our color chart permanently to the scene. To do that, we can use flow graph. To create a flow graph, I usually drop down an entity such as an area trigger. Here I've just put it somewhere out of the way and I've called it global flow graph. Go to the properties of the area trigger, scroll down and click open. This will create a new flow graph. Inside the flow graph, you can see your new entity is listed. The next step is to add the nodes we need to trigger our color chart. Go to add node, game, start, and bring in a start node. Next, go to add node, image, color gradient. Once you have these two nodes in your flow graph, connect them together from output to trigger. Using the texture path browser, you can select your color chart from the textures color charts folder. Now when we jump in game, our color chart should be triggered. To check that's actually working, to check that's actually working, you can type r underscore color grading charts equal to two in the console. You'll then see a label above the viewport that tells you which color chart is currently in use. Well, I think that pretty much covers everything. I'd like to thank all the great artists at Quixel and Crytek for providing these awesome assets. CryEngine does a great job of looking after performance as you build large scenes like this. This scene was created on a rather modest PC. I'll put the specs in the description. I hope you guys liked the results and I hope you found this tutorial useful. If you'd like to give me any feedback, you can find my contact details in the description below. Achieved with CryEngine.